Hi folks, so I want to talk about how we're going to organize our class, this art history class, and how we're going to approach every week and every topic that we're discussing in this class, including writing assignments. So I want to start with what your book says. So your book asks, what questions do art historians ask? And I'm going to go through this a bit quick because you've read it. Your textbook asks how old it is, when it was made, you know, if it's really old painting, really new painting. Um, uh, and they're asking about when the actual painting was made. For example, this one shows a really old story, but they're asking how old the painting itself is, 1784. Not as old as the, the clothing that the folks are wearing. What is its style? And I'm just going to hold on to that one for a minute. We'll come back to it. What is its subject? So who's depicted in the artwork? Who are we looking at? Um, and how can we tell? Who made it? Um, you know, we don't necessarily know the artist who made this um, prehistoric art. We know some things about them. Uh, we do know the artist's name who created this one. And similarly, we know some things about that artist, although we don't necessarily know everything about the artist. As we get into the modern era, we know more. Your textbook also asks who paid for it. Who's the patron? Who commissioned this artwork to be made? or, you know, who chose for it to be made. Could also be, was it made for a king, like an armor, King Narmer here? Don't worry about it, we'll, we're not talking about him this quarter. Um, and sometimes who paid for it influences how it gets made. Uh, if you're the king and you're paying for the artwork, uh, you're going to say, by the way, make me look really great. Make me look powerful and large and stuff like that. So um, that is what your textbook talks about. But I actually would like to organize our class differently. All right. So these are all lovely questions to answer, to, to ask and answer. And we will answer them, but we're going to organize them differently. OK, so this is the organizing that we're going to take in class. We are going to talk about four different categories physical properties, visual structure, subject and symbolism, and integration into cultural context. Now, don't worry about understanding those entirely because the rest of this lecture is going to be talking about them. So I'm going to start with the one that I think is probably easiest, subject and symbolism. Conventional symbolism is just a way of saying um, the symbolism from a particular time, like everyone agrees that this is what this means. Um, and as an example here, uh, in our culture, we wear, I'm oh, sorry, in Western culture, in America, we tend, in the U.S., we tend to wear white wedding dresses. The color of a wedding is white. Um, whereas in other parts of the world, but also other times in history, a white dress would have, would have said you were in mourning, right? You were, you were sad. You were, uh, someone you loved had passed away. Um, so conventional symbolism can change, and that's just why we toss in that extra word, uh, conventional, rather than just symbolism. Um, so when we look at a work like this, and we, we can pretty quickly identify the subject. There's a man or a person, their head is down, um, the, uh, there's some owls and some bats, and some sort of cat looking thing, large cat. We can recognize the subject. What is going to take a little bit more work is to figure out the, con the symbolism. What do bats and, and owls and cats mean? And we, as, as just people coming into this class for the first time, can guess at some of these. Like bats and owls tend to be, you know, nocturnal and, and um, kind of uh, scary maybe a little bit. Um, but if we were to talk to the artist or, to, or read about the artist, which you could do in chapter 22, um, we'll learn a little bit more about what he intended those to mean. So I want to give you another way of thinking about this. So I want to draw a mind map. And I can't figure out how to draw it on my computer, so I've drawn it in pieces, and we'll piece it together. But this mind map is going to start in the middle with something called style. And style, remember I told you we're going to hold off on that a little bit? Style is what the artwork is. Uh, you might also, you might instead in the middle, you could put meaning, right? The meaning of an artwork. Everything about it. And so from this, w when we're talking about an artwork, we might put the artwork's title in the middle as well. I've put style in there. Um, <laughs> because it's going to interact with how we're going to do our written reports. 
Off of style, we might draw a line and identify subject. So one of the things that influences the style or influences what the meaning of the artwork is, is the subject, what we have a picture of. But there's some different parts of subject we can talk about. Um, we could talk about <coughs> iconography, symbolism, conventions, and these are three that we'll talk about. Maybe there's some more things we can talk about, um, but these are kind of the big ones that we might cover. We just talked about symbolism. So if we see somebody, you know, we see a woman in the painting and she's wearing a white dress, that might tell us, oh, she, maybe she's getting married, right? Or maybe it's a, trying to tell us about purity or something like that, uh, depending on the time period. We can also refer to iconography, and I'm going to sneak ahead here for just a moment. Look at what this person is wearing. You might have, the first time you look at this, if you don't know when it was made, you might think, well, this person is wearing some kind of tights, some kind of, you know, knee, knee socks or tights and, and kind of delicate shoes. That iconography, those, that image of those pieces of clothing, suggests to us now that this might be a woman, right? You don't usually see a lot of men wearing clothes like that. If you're familiar with the clothing of the time, and you know when the artwork was made, you might read that as um, the type of clothing worn by a man at, the, at that time in uh, 1798, right? So we've, we've talked about symbolism. Um, in the picture we just looked at, the bats may symbolize uh, scary, you know, something scary or, or something uh, hidden um, in the night. Iconography might tell us when this person lived or who this person is. So their clothing, their hairstyle, something they might be holding that helps us identify them. A really good example here is uh, if you're looking at Christian art and someone has a halo, they're probably a saint of some sort. And then conventions gets a little trickier. Um, so conventions is rules about how you paint or draw people or animals. And we'll, we'll get to conventions a little bit, all right, a little bit later. It's coming up. It's something we can talk about. So we might talk about subject. Who's the picture? What are they wearing? How can we tell who they are? What are they doing? What's the event going on? All of that, all right? That's subject. We're going to move on to the next one. So off of that central artwork or the meaning or the general style, <clears throat> we might also talk about physical properties. Physical properties is deceptively simple. So it's, a, it's, a, it's something people tend to overlook when they're talking about an artwork. Physical properties means the material of the painting or the sculpture or whatever it is. So one of these things might be um, this here is a painting. I'm actually reading over here that this is an oil painting on canvas. This is the medium here. Um, and it's, I would understand this differently if this were a photograph or if somebody had created a life-size sculpture of this thing. It's also important when talking about the physical properties to understand the size and how big something is. This is a uh, 16 foot by 23 foot. See where I'm getting that? Oops. Um, see where I'm getting that right here in the 16 to 23, 23 and a half feet, actually. This is a huge painting. Don't you understand it differently than if I told you it's a teeny tiny little painting? It has a different impact. So if we go back to our mind map, we can talk about physical properties and then medium, size, or format. And format really means shape. Is this a square, a rectangular, or a circle? Is this a sculpture of a person or a sculpture of a whole scene of a whole bunch of people, right? And uh, notice already that format, when we're talking about sculpture, might feel a lot like subject. If you have the shape of a sculpture might be a person, and it might be a sculpture of a person. So we, person might be subject, person might be format. These can overlap a little bit with each other. We talk about a lot of paintings in this, in this class, but we also talk about sculptures and uh, architecture as well. So when we're talking about art history, I mean, sorry, when we're talking about physical properties, we're talking about materials, what it's made out of, how big it is, and what shape it is. This is a very large oil painting that is in a rectangular shape. The rectangle is wider than it is tall. All of that stuff helps us understand this artwork and its physical properties. Let's move on to visual structure. This one, that remember I said physical properties is deceptively simple because people forget to talk about it. They overlook it. 
Visual structure is one that's just straight going to be challenging. You're going to, it's going to take some work getting used to using these terms. So visual structure, we are going to divide into composition and formal elements. And in both of these cases, we're talking about where stuff is or what the stuff is that makes up the artwork. Now, when we look at this painting right here, we know it is an oil on canvas. It is three feet by two and a half feet, more or less. Uh, it's taller than it is wide. All of that is physical properties, all right? We can recognize the subject. It appears to be a man standing on a rock looking out over, you know, water or mist or something. All of that is subject. Now, visual structure is where is the man? What kinds of colors or shapes or lines are used in the artwork? Uh, where are we supposed to look? Are there a similar amount of things on one side or the other, on the top or the bottom? Um, or do we get a sense of there being a depth or realistic space? Or if we're talking about a sculpture, real space? Let's go back to our mind map. So style, I'm sorry, off of the artwork or the style, we have visual structure. Visual structure has formal elements, and these are the pieces that, um, that make up the artwork. So we might talk about line, uh, we might talk about shape or mass, we might talk about whether we see depth or the illusion of depth, we might talk about colors or color schemes used. Hey, did you notice that color also showed up with symbolism? So here's another place where we have a little bit of potential overlap. Um, uh, depth, light, tone. Let's, let's look at an example. So in this artwork, there are some really important lines. They are these, the lines of the guns that point us from these guys over to this guy. We also have some lines that are this guy's hands. He's holding them up in the air, uh, drawing our attention to him. Uh, these guys are all lined up. They are standing in a line, right? It's not a drawn line, but they are lined up, and that is a type of line, an implied line. We also have shapes. We have this, uh, these kind of rectangular shapes of their hats. We have the big, uh, the bright shape of this guy. We have color that's an emphasis here. We see a lot of color that is lighter here and some darker colors on either side. We have this color that tells us something about what's happening in the artwork. We have shadows and, and lights. We can see that the light source is coming from here, and we can see shadows that fall behind these men or behind these men over here. Textures, patterns, we can tell the materials that they're wearing. We get a sense of depth. This person appears to be farther away than this person. This church is farther away. This appears to ha be happening in a real space, and it's helpful to see the, the depth that we see here. Um, and, and this is an illusion of depth. All of that stuff is formal elements. And notice how much there is. I just zoomed through all that. There's a lot to talk about. And we're going to get lots and lots of opportunities to practice talking about formal elements. We can also talk about composition. And that is the arrangement of those formal elements, the arrangement of stuff. We might have a sense of balance, or we might have a rhythm or a repetition. Something might be the most important, the emphasis in the artwork. Something might be a larger or smaller scale to either give us a sense of emphasis or to show where things are in space. We might also have a, a sense of unity or variety, things that are similar or different in the artwork. So let's look at, a, at an architecture. So here we're looking at a photograph of architecture, but let's talk about the building and not the photograph. So here we have a repetition of these lines of the columns. We have uh, a sense that these are all the same size. Now this is tricky, right, because we're looking at a photograph. And in the photograph, we see that these columns get smaller, and that helps us know that these are farther away. But in the building itself, they are all the same size, which gives a sense of unity and balance all the way around the artwork. We're going to get lots more opportunities to practice talking about composition. You're going to have a practice assignment, but I also want you practicing this in the discussion forums every week. Um, I'm going to need to, there's more that I want to talk about here, but I need to break this video up into two. So we'll come, we'll come back and we'll talk about cultural context.